Please forget. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, we had a bumpy start yesterday by which we had a faulty link. Uh, so I didn't want to miss Jess, nor did I want to shortchange her and not have that interactive element. So if you put your uh, view on gallery view, you can see everyone who joins, or you can put it on speaker view and you just focus on Jackie, uh, Jesse. Well, you know what, I keep looking at Jackie's. I seriously, I keep looking at Jess, Jackie and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to put you down, Jackie. I, I, okay, so I can't see you. It's uh, because of the great hair. I no, no gray blonde. It's exciting. So I want to thank everyone. Like I said, uh, I want to introduce Jess. Uh, Jess and I started talking probably in March, so we would we were mid COVID talking, um, and we were planning a lot of things. I ran across her sessions that she had uh, prepared for a different company. So they were focused even on a different track. But I said, just by her persona and what she has to offer, I have to get her in front of iState. The faculty, staff, and students would definitely enjoy what she has to offer. So this uh, is the first of three for this semester, and then I'll have her back next semester to continue the conversation. So the, the beauty of it is that Jess is going to connect each conversation in some way. Uh, so by way of introduction, Jess has been doing this for about 15 years, if not more. She stopped counting, uh, doing diversity training for different organizations. I think the one that I focused on was for a health field uh, or a health organization, but she can tailor what her conversation about is about. Um, she wants to incorporate actionable items for people to actually engage in after the conversation. So that's the beauty of what she's bringing. She's extremely personable. And um, between the two of us, she has more humor. So you're going to enjoy what she has to offer. So without further ado, I will stop sharing and introduce you to Jessica Pettit. Well, thank you very much. It's quite the introduction. So now I hope I can live up to that standard. Uh, what is interesting, I think, is I have actually worked quite a bit within the medical community. And um, it should be, am I successfully sharing my slides? Yes? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, my computer's being a little extra temperamental today, just to keep us on our toes. Um, so uh, I, ha I have worked primarily uh, in the last couple of years, for sure, within the health industry, I guess you would say, of hospitals or ERs, but I actually had my start in higher education. So uh, I have a master's in higher education administration, and then I worked in multicultural services, res life, campus activities, um, running LGBT centers or women's centers in a number of different institutions around the country. Uh, the fun facts when I get to say I worked in a number of institutions is, is that I had the kind of job where I was supposed to point out how the university was underserving its silenced and marginalized communities. So in doing that work, I would produce a report and then I would get fired from the university because we're not always doing a great job. Oftentimes the university in itself is actually part of the systemic process that happens within local uh, folks of color, whether we're talking about faculty, staff, or students, or local community members. And um, my own work within student affairs, it, I couldn't do that anymore. It felt very kind of hypocritical to be the person that has the weight of doing the diversity work to, that I wasn't ever actually going to get to dismantle anything. So after being fired a number of times, I had the privileges enough of getting hired at another university. It's a great Michelle shocked lyric of I never found a job from which I was not fired and I never found a town in which I was not hired. Um, so kind of did that system for a little bit. And then I started my own consulting or speaking business back in 2005, where oddly, even the universities that actually I had worked at have all brought me back in as a consultant. So where we were joking with the people who were on earlier, I have a very large personality and as long as you're not sheltering in place with it or having to have me at a weekly staff meeting, it seems to be very helpful. But in doing the work that I did, I kept being asked for a virtual diversity training. Like, can you just do an online class or something like this? 
And I've noticed that as uh, trends and language have changed, um, probably within the last two years or so, I'd have people from different organizations or associations, more corporate side, like, can you just come in and like Windex off our unconscious bias? We heard that we had some unconscious bias. We did a survey. And could you just like get rid of that? Well, unfortunately, unconscious bias isn't like a tick. So you have to actually do some real work in order to Windex anything off. And fun facts, much like a tick, you have to be very careful how you remove said bad things because it can get really messy. So I just kicked and screamed. I'm not making a virtual program. All of these things should always be in person. This shouldn't happen. So about five years ago, and this is what Dr. Urban was referring, but about five years ago, I was working with a children's ER a division in a hospital and because of the third shift you can't really shut down a hospital so i had to create an online program to be able to have these conversations for the folks that would never get off work in the first place or to be honest weren't going to come to the training in the first place so luckily what we're going to do today is the first kind of shift the first installment literally the starting place and what I would like us to be able to do is first off recognize some of us are not new to this conversation. Some of y'all are like, why is a white lady doing this work? I'm going to show up, make sure she's okay. Some people are brand new to this conversation. All of these things are possible. And so when I created the program, what I wanted to be able to do was to create a series that would fit together so that you can have a raucous conversation with yourself because yourself is actually the common denominator with all the people that you're interacting with. So before we can get to uh, unconscious bias, we have to start beforehand to even like, who are you and how did you get to be who you are? So that's what I mean by the starting place. You may possibly be expecting a different kind of program. So I'm just gonna go ahead and buckle up. It's not that kind of diversity program. You may, hopefully I'm doing my job and I'll be thought provoking. So if you're watching the recording or later on, if you have questions or even now, you're welcome to use the chat. I can monitor it in real time, or you can send me a text message to 202-670-4262. Anytime you ever have a question or you are in a pickle, feel free to text message. I'm happy to help. You'd be amazed how often I give this number out, but I don't get people taking me up on it. But you paid for it. Feel free to text me when you need me, not when I just show up online. So 202-670-4262. So because chances are you have been to a number of very bad diversity trainings and now this one's online, let me tell you what this isn't going to be. I am not going to roll through a bunch of handouts or a bunch of vocabulary and if you upgrade your current vocabulary, you will never offend anybody else because that doesn't actually work. And instead of trying to like this idea of being perfect, uh, what ends up happening I've noticed in my research is that people actually think by not doing something or by not engaging that it's somehow less offensive than trying to engage and making some kind of mistake. And the reality is, is that not engaging can actually be just as offensive as engaging in a wrong way. Um, so it's not necessarily a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing. The problem is, is that we're not taking the time to figure out how has our life taught us to be and using how our life has taught us to be as the best tool we have for the relationships that we have. So that's really what we're going to be talking about. Now, in order to start, like I said, some of you may be very new to these conversations. Some of you are not new to these conversations, but chances are there is somebody out there in your world that you do not want to have these conversations with because their heels are dug in, your heels are dug in, and you're like, not them. Great. Don't have this conversation with them. Have this conversation with other people so that you can like engage and actually like practice these skills. To do this, one of the things that I've noticed, because I often have to have very challenging conversations with very challenging people, because that's what I like to do. One of the commonality starting places, I think, is what are we responsible for? And a friend of mine who identifies as Muslim, she was telling me a story about one of her practices that says you are responsible for 40 houses around you. So I made a joke, of course, that the 41st house like sucks to be you, but your neighbor is responsible for them. Right, so you're only responsible for 40 houses. 
for some, that's like a comforting limitation. Like, oh, okay, I can kind of put my hands around 40 houses. You may be familiar with seven generations out. That is much bigger than 40 houses and can be kind of overwhelming. And often that overwhelm can help people not pay attention to what their impact is or what they're responsible for. Moreover, what I think is important is that there's a lot of line of thoughts out there that ultimately you are only responsible for yourself. And like, whether this is a political standpoint or something else, I think what's important to understand is that let's just go with that. If it's better to be responsible for 40 houses out or seven generations out, but those can be a little overwhelming. If the base common denominator is being responsible for yourself, we could start there because a lot of times we're not doing an awesome job of even being responsible for ourselves. So what I wanted to do in this particular webinar before we get to unconscious bias in the next one is I want to spend some time to show you what I mean by being responsible for yourself. So I'm going to use myself, congratulations, probably going to be a lot of overexposure and TMI coming, but I'm going to use myself as the example. So you do not ever have to share anything with anybody else. But I invite you to use this hour to engage in a challenging conversation with yourself. Because even if you think you're only in charge of a party of one, this is my friend Sheila and her son Jimmy. Jimmy is now in his 20s because I'm old. I have good skin. What's fascinating when we were taking these pictures of Sheila and soon to be Jimmy is it was the first time that I began to realize how responsibility can shift. Sheila and I were wild first year students in college together. We had a blast. I don't remember what classes I took. I'd have to check my transcript. We had an amazing time. She is now one of the most responsible mothers I have ever have of any of my friends. And I would not have guessed that as an 18 year old. We are capable of change and the concept of responsibility can change as our responsibilities change. So I don't want to negate any of the lived experience that you've had up to this point. Some of us have survived a lot of things to get to this point. And some of us, this is a relatively new conversation. Your starting place is exactly that. It's your starting place. You're nailing it. You're doing great. Now, what are we gonna do with this starting place? So I am gonna talk a little bit about some vocabulary words, but they're not the usual suspect ones. So I first have to start with ethnocentrism. This is a pretty academic-y intellectual word. It's good for crossword puzzles. But basically what this means is, is that your worldview is at the center. And likely so, it's because your worldview is how you see the world. So it kind of stays in the center and by virtue of being in the center as you interact with other things, it kind of nudges it still in the center. Every once in a while you have a different perspective that's like, whoa, where'd that come from? And it's because it's not what you would normally hold in the center, that's why it feels new. I grew up in Texas, you're welcome. And in Texas, there is a giant factory that makes maps. I don't know what it's called, but I can always tell when a map came from this place because the state of Texas is like two thirds of North America, basically. It's bigger than Florida, it's bigger than California, it's bigger than Alaska. That is not actually the size of Texas. Do not tell any Texan that. But when the map comes out of Texas, the state of Texas is sizable, not just in the lower 48, but in North America. And it's such a great example of taking a three-dimensional object down to a two-dimensional object. It's already going to be skewed or warped, right? This is not an earth flat workshop. That's a different session. So I'm going to go with a three-dimensional object down to a two-dimensional object is already going to be a little skewed, but then who's drawing it is going to make it like extra skewed. When, when that makes sense. Okay, sure. So when we start talking about difference or identities that you do or you do not have, you're going to keep your lived experience at the center, even in conversations where we talk about how important it is to be responsible for yourself, we almost always go, you are right. Let's go talk about them. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about you. We default to talking about them because it's actually easier than beginning to actually pay attention to where where and what are we holding in the center that is potentially biasing positive or negative, conscious or unconscious, how we are interacting with other elements of the world. 
that's it. That's all it is. If we could just do that, this webinar would be over and there wouldn't be three more to come. But we can't just do that for some reason, so here we are. Imagine a world without your center. So this is a really great piece of art from Dred Scott that you'll notice on the map, the lower 48 are kind of missing. Florida's there because we can't get rid of Florida if we wanted to. But wait till, wait till global warming, it's our only hope. But what is so interesting to me about this map is the first time I saw this piece of art, it took me a good five minutes to read the words because I was trying to figure out where the United States was because it was not in the center. It's actually over on the, it's not even present. Then I read the words, imagine a world without America. That is the kind of exercise that we need to do. And what I'm encouraging, me even, is I'm encouraging us to imagine what things exist, what experiences may feel like without our experience being present. Oftentimes you may be gifted with some information about someone else's experience that you've never experienced. And when that happens, what ends up happening is we get defensive because we've never experienced it. Or we get dismissive because we've never experienced it. It doesn't have to be a problem for you to be real for someone else. And that someone else is disclosing that problem to you. So noticing what you're holding at the center is one thing, but also noticing what you're holding at the margins is another. Next, you may be familiar with the use of the words equity and inclusion. We used the word equality for a while and it's kind of switched to equity. So not everyone kind of understands this. So I like to use shoes as an example. I have a shoe problem, it's very true. So equality would be everyone gets a pair of shoes. Now I wear a size 11 shoe and seem to be pretty partial to vans with weird patterns on them. I just got some Star Wars vans. I'm pretty excited. I haven't even taken them out of the box yet because what if I were to ruin them? You may not wear a size 11 woman shoe and you might not be into vans, but equality would be congratulations. Everyone gets a pair of size 11 Star Wars vans. You should be as happy as me. That's what equality stands for. Equity means that you actually have to do the pesky work of engaging in a conversation to actually find out what size shoe do people wear? What's their life like? Do they like slip on shoes? If you were to give me a size 11 pair of stilettos, that would be an unfortunate choice because I'm not, I could use it as a vase maybe, I don't know, but it certainly wouldn't be a shoe to me. So we've kind of switched to equity to be able to really honor what it means to have a conversation with someone to find out what they want or need. And then we provide the opportunity for what they need and how they need it. That's equity. And inclusion is including them in the opportunity in the first place. So a little bit of a shift in language, but so important. And yes, I'm happy to share you the link. The secret is to go to zappos.com, search under vans, and then go to clearance. If you have ginormous feet, they'll be in there. I also got some with pineapples on them. Okay, so if we've done equity and inclusion, y'all are all writing down the Star Wars thing. I see you, I can see you. Okay, so now let's get to more language. So dominant and subordinated identities. So interestingly, I think maybe Marie Kondo is responsible for this. But we tend to go to this very easy binary where everything is either this or this, even though we know it's actually way more complicated than that. We like to pretend that there's only two options. What's important to remember about a binary, though, is that the two options are dependent on the other option. Something can't be subordinated by something that isn't dominant. Something can't be dominant if it doesn't actively subordinate something. So when we start talking about dominant or subordinated identities, and for subordinated, you may hear silenced, marginalized, minoritized, and I'll talk about why I don't use some of those words in a second. But dominant identities mean the ones that kind of magically get extra unicorn points in our culture. There's a lot of things that people perceive about people. They don't even have to be real or factual, but like they instantly get this unicorn glitter points. That's what I mean. There's power and privilege related to that dominant identity. It doesn't necessarily have to be like salient or something that you think about all the time, but it's something that comes with these unicorn points. Then there are identities that often people also didn't choose that don't 
we do not give them unicorn points. It's not about less or more unicorn points. It's that they don't even get any. Now they might get some in a different category and they don't get some in other categories. So we all just kind of walk around with our unicorn point pouches, so to speak. But I want you to kind of think about this because when we start talking about who and how are you, who and how am I? How did my life teach me that this is the way to show up? Some of you are probably asking that question. And back to the person that you don't even want to have these conversations with, it is a very interesting question to ask what could have happened in their life to teach them that that is the way they are supposed to show up. Even though it's probably going to be followed by, I don't know, but it's wrong, is way wrong. It gives you at least a 30 second window to wonder what happened in their life that taught them that this is how to show up. My brother and I are wildly different when it comes to politics and religion and all of those things. And it's really fascinating because we were raised in the same family and we turned out wildly different. But we are also very similar. He tries to be funny. It's true. I have the funny. He's a very good looking guy. I have the luxury of developing a personality. You're welcome. But he's got very strong work ethic. Um, if he were to pick up some kind of ball thing, he instantly knows how to play that sport. I am not a sporty person, but if you instantly tell me that there is a problem or I need to like organize a closet, I instantly know how to do that. We're very similar and wildly different. But our lives have taught us to turn out the way we did, even though a lot of that life was the same place. It's a fascinating conversation to have. I encourage the starting point is to have this conversation with yourself, because sometimes that's better than doing it with witnesses, especially if you haven't had the conversation with yourself. So I'm going to disclose some things about myself. And if you are interested in playing along, grab some pen and paper. So we'll start with my subordinated identities, which is this is some of them we're going to talk about. And a lot of us come to diversity or social justice work from subordinated places. That's why some folks you're like, uh, I don't think I have any subordinated identities. So at one point you were too young, maybe that worked. And at one point you're going to be too old. So then it'll show back up. Age is a good one. But for me, my subordinated identities, you need to be able to pay attention to whether they're visible or invisible if you're playing along at home. So one, I identify as a lesbian or a queer person. That's usually not too sh shattering, earth shattering for anybody, because either I do this work or I currently have short pink hair. I never know what color it's going to be. It's always dealer's choice. So between my occupation and how I present myself, people usually assume that I'm a lesbian or I'm queer. Great. So that's a visible subordinated identity because I'm not perceived to be straight. Okay. I don't identify as a Christian. My brother and I were both raised by atheist parents with very Baptist grandparents. And my brother ended up an evangelical Christian and I'm probably more agnostic. It's actually kind of a fun question because by virtue of being an agnostic, I don't know. But it's invisible what my religious identity is because people generally assume I'm probably a Christian. What is also interesting due to Christianity being such a dominant identity in US culture, I know all the words to the Christmas songs, even though I have never celebrated Christmas, right? So there's some benefits to being an invisible subordinated identity because I pass, I'm using air quotes, as a Christian because I can hum the right tune. So my physical ability issues are usually pretty invisible, largely because I don't like asking people for help. But if I were to come to campus, there are times where I'll be like, let's take the elevator or maybe I need to grab a chair, but I'll take care of myself or my hips or my knees, or whatever's hurting in the given moment, because I do have quite a bit of physical ability limitations, but they're generally invisible. I identify as a woman that is usually not too shocking to people especially if I'm wearing a pink fuzzy hoodie. So that might qualify as visible. So just as some examples and feel free again on your side to play along. What are some of the subordinated or marginalized identities you experience? If you want to practice, like if this is new to you, always start at age. Because what's weird about age is you change the venue and it changes whether it is subordinated or it is silenced or marginalized 
or it's dominant. Because there are times where I walk into a room and they're like, hello, grandma, which is even worse than being called a boomer, especially if you're a Gen Xer. There are other times I walk in the room where people think I'm 12. And so it's very shocking to them that I have any experience or any ideas. So depending on which room I'm in may depend on whether or not or why I feel silenced or marginalized. And then there's your regular space. So it's a good practice spot. Thoughts, comments, or questions about this before we move along? Looking at the chat. You're also welcome to text message 202-670-4262 if you have any questions or anything. So we'll move along to my dominant identities. Again, feel free to play at home. So I identify as a white person. That is usually not shocking to anyone. And some white people, we do the weird thing like I am a vampire because I'm allergic to the sun. That is very true. I am actually allergic to the sun, but I have never in my entire life been mistaken as a not white person. I'm a white person and it is very visible about me. So I get all the unicorn points that comes from being a white person. Even if it's a phone call or an email, my name is Jessica. The way that I use language shows that I'm, or at least people draw conclusions that I'm a native English speaker, which they immediately assume I'm a US citizen. They assume I'm highly educated. And oddly, they will also assume that I am a, a, at least middle class, if not upper middle class. So a, a native English speaker is that it's my first language. So I actually speak another language fluently um, Bulgarian. I was in the Peace Corps in Bulgaria. Of course, I was in the Peace Corps. I speak fluent Bulgarian, which comes in handy almost never, but uh, at least not here. Uh, but that's true. So anyway, so how I use language is associated to my image as well as to my name, how many unicorn points I'm going to get by virtue of an email or a phone call or possibly an in-person live interaction. Um, so that's where that comes from. So even when you saw the flyer for these webinars, I instantly got some unicorn points for all that just getting smushed together and I didn't even like out myself with any of those identities. I am also legally married. I'm almost 50. So again, age is fun. Um, I'm super extroverted and have been sheltering in place for six months. Please send help. Um, all of these things come with some level of unicorn points. So again, if the starting point is who and how are you, have you done an inventory of your subordinated and marginalized identities and your dominant identities? What's interesting is most folks who do diversity or social justice work, we're much more familiar with our subordinated identities because often the social justice and diversity work that we're doing is so that we can stay alive and often we're not successful at that. When we are just literally trying to live a life, we are often fighting for our own white right to live, our own sense of equality, our own community sense of equality. That's doing organizing work from our subordinated places. So there may be more familiarity there. When I started getting burnt out of my work, doing work from this place, I switched my work to encourage people to do work from their dominant places, including me, because if I can do work for my dominant places, it doesn't, it's not as much of a risk, right? Like I'm not fighting for my own ability to live or show up in a space. For some of y'all, just showing up is already an act of revolution from your subordinated places. From your dominant places, we like to call this work or a hobby, or it's like really interesting and it's so hard, right? It's a very tough learning curve. And while we're on this learning curve, people are actually suffering and dying. The more we learn doesn't mean the less this happens. They're actually happening at the same time. So you have to be motivated by the hard work because people are dying. That's the balance there. So if you're not in touch with what your dominant identities are or what privileges you have, even inside COVID, if you are currently employed you have a job right now. Guess what? That is actually considered a privilege. I am married to a lecturer and one of the professors that I'm, I'm in an MBA program right now because I'm basically unemployed due to COVID. So in my MBA program, one of my professors told me that they're very busy. They have two classes and they have to do research. They're very, very busy. 
So my partner is a lecturer and teaches five classes, five classes, and is paid a third of what she's paid and is the chapter union president. And it is all bonkers right now because of COVID. So even if you have a job, what kind of job you got, right? Like who's got, like, even if it's a, even if you're just a professor, like to those of us not in academics, as a professor, you're fine. Are you an adjunct and a lecturer with no job security? Are you a tenured full professor? that like can pretty much do almost anything you're interested in because that's how academia works. There's unicorn points there, right? But there's some unicorn points here because at least adjuncts have jobs right now. So it can be a fluid thing about whether or not you get the unicorn points, but most of us don't do the work to find out how we are doing right now and who we are right now. So that's the starting place. Then we come up with power and privilege. I particularly like this image when I think about power and privilege because I like to think of power and privilege as opportunity. So there are some people who have opportunities to give out and there are other people who will be potentially options of getting the opportunity. That's the divide. I don't use the word minoritize because I think it brings up math too much and there's often far fewer people in power than the people who are not in power. So I ask you, when you look at this picture, the people on the left, let's say that they are the subordinated group. The people on the right are the dominant group or the power, the privileged group. They're the ones with the opportunity. My question to you, and you don't have to answer this out loud or in the chat, but you're welcome to. So when you look at this picture, are those two people opening the door or are they holding the door closed? Or is it one of those weird doors you have to push in before you can open it? The reason why I'm asking is, is that if you see this image and you see people keeping a door closed, then you're probably coming at this work from your subordinated places. Okay, no judgment there. And can you also come to this work from the other side? Because other people also see you on the other side of these doors, whether it's because you have a PhD or because you have access to a budget or because you're a grown up or because you own a home, who knows? There's a lot of reasons that you could have dominant identities. And if you look at this picture and you come from that side, you're probably coming from your dominant identities. The goal is to be able to practice both. And by holding both, then you'll be able to develop your own empathy or cultural humility is kind of the new buzzword now, is that you're able to take your cultural competence or your education or your expertise and bring it with you and then just set it to the side and have an actual interaction with this individual because you're able to be humble enough to realize you don't know this individual. You can ask questions you don't know the answers to. Then you can actually bring a sense of humility to the work and practice both sides of the doors. So uh, thoughts, comments, the question again, I'll type it into the chat, the text number again is 202-670-4262 uh, for texts. Feel free to text if you have anything. I don't have any yet. Um, other questions, comments? How are we doing out there? Are we ready to talk about them? Do you know who them are? Uh, them are the ones that you're like, I'm actually fine. It's them. Have you met them? I almost always just call them Todd. If any of you are named Todd, I'm probably talking about you. But them out there, they're the ones that are the problem. I'm doing just fine. But if they would change, then, then everything would be better. So here's the problem with that. It's a little bit of grammar. So if I'm my team and they are their team, then when they over there are talking, they're looking at me as a them because that's what we do. That's literally how we stay so polarized. We believe we are right, right, because we are us and usins are right. It's them over there. They are the ones that are wrong and the wrong ones, them ones over there, do you see what's happening? If I was somebody's them, then I'm gonna be this group's us. So there's no work. We need to stop doing this. This is literally how we stay super polarized, right? And people are making a ton of money off of us feeling very polarized. Stop, stop, stop doing this. So the key is to stop being an us and them and just recognize that you are somebody's them. 
It's you. Don't worry about them. You've been worrying about them and it hadn't worked. So if you are somebody's them, notice I'm pointing to myself. If you are somebody's them, what can you do to make that a little bit more open? I believe you are correct. I am using a cursing filter, so I'm gonna call them a donkey. You're right, they are a total donkey. A hundred percent wrong donkey. But that also means so are you. So am I, so are us. Look, we're back to us. We are all very problematic. Super problematic. If you think that you are not problematic, you're problematic right now because you're ruining my metaphor. So you, if we can do our own work on how we are the problem, or we can be a problem, we can practice from that space because it's way less risk. Because ultimately we're doing that work from our places of dominance. Now, not all of us can afford to do this because being able to try to just live every day is really taking up a lot of our time which is why it takes all of us, see what I did there, to do this work. Now, I came up in my research with the concept of differently right. I married a philosopher, so I do not mean moral relativism here. I believe in one sense of morality. However, I do believe that we can actually hold space for them, these very wrong thems, we can hold space to find out that their life has taught them that this is the right way to show up. That is differently right in this moment. Let's find out more. If we begin to have the concept of differently right, then not only do we start asking questions we don't know the answers to, and we start actually having an authentic, engaged conversation, but they actually get to show up how they want to show up and not just how we see them. And more importantly, we get to show up the way we want to show up and not just the way they see us. We write stories about each other to feel safe and prepared. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with feeling safe and prepared, but that doesn't mean you're accurate. That's the really key piece is that to be accurate, you're gonna to have to listen and engage with the other person to find out what the accurate information is. Now, I like to pick really, really controversial topics. So how about colonization, Western expansion? Sound good? Let's go there. So here's what's fun. We're not gonna talk about a failed attempt at genocide. That is also a different workshop. But what we are gonna talk about is just a couple hundred years of history and about a 30 second point. Okay, here I go. Bunch of white dudes came over from Western Europe to a piece of land where they thought would not be occupied by human beings. Those white dudes are used to patriarchy even though they had queens. We'll talk about that later. So these patriarchal white dudes show up. They come over and they're like, oh my God, there's people here. Hey, take me to your leader. So women start showing up and they're like, cute, hospitality crew. Can you take me to your leader? Can you take me to your leader? Take me to your leader. Uh-huh, nice, thank you for the biscuits. Can you take me to your leader? Because a patriarchal society doesn't recognize women as leaders. Whereas most of the indigenous populations that still live today and actually were living at the time were matriarchal organizations. So they did actually take them to the leader because the fearless leader showed up and was like, dude, you are very pale. What is wrong with you? So because there was a misconception about what was actually happening, because you had a patriarchy talking to men who eventually showed up, like, I guess you want me, they were miscommunicating about what leadership really was because they didn't check their own worldview. Now, other side, when we start talking about the indigenous populations, these dudes who are actually showed up because the women were like, I don't know, they won't talk to us. So they showed up and then the white men were like, we would like to buy your land. And the men were like, oh, you want to share the land? Okay, sure, we're down with sharing, sounds great. But they also didn't know that people actually own land or feel like they are entitled to own land because land was actually respected as its own entity. So you didn't own it, you shared it with the land. So they're like, all right, cool, you can share. But these guys from the patriarchy didn't understand the concept of sharing, just like these guys from the matriarchy didn't understand the idea of ownership. Do you see how that miscommunication is going to lead to disaster, even if you take out the fact that we've broken every single treaty we've ever had with an indigenous population, but that's also a different workshop. So, I bring this to you because if you can't, if you're literally waiting for them to catch up to your definitions, this is just gonna keep happening again. 
you have to do the work to say like, hey, are we operating with the same set of definitions here? Let me do a little check-in. What do you mean by that? Tell me more. And you're going to have to engage in conversations. And then that is how you will actually be able to operate under the same kind of understanding. Now, with the same understanding, we also often reduce our same understanding down to symbols, right? Now, I will be honest, I have not spent a lot of time in the men's restroom, but I'm pretty sure it is uncommon that you ever find a solid black stick figure using the sink. I don't think I have it. I will report from a women's bathroom, very few black stick figures wearing capes show up in a women's bathroom. But based on the symbols on the door, that seems to be who's allowed to go in there. But the reality is, is that this symbol has a cultural meaning. And the cultural meaning is then policed by the people inside because we assume we know the cultural meaning more than somebody else does. So you may be thinking, did she just go from like failed attempts at genocide to trans bathrooms? Sure did, why start with the easy stuff? So what's so fascinating to me about trans bathroom use is that every single person watching this call at some point in time has walked into the wrong bathroom. And we have walked in either the line was too long and I gotta pee, so then I like wait in a stall until it empties out and then leave, right? Or I don't care because I gotta pee. There are other times I might be two steps into a men's bathroom and be like, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place because I am actually capable of identifying what space I am supposed to be in. That is something I'm capable of doing. But what often happens is we see someone else and we determine they don't know any better and I know better. So then I start policing the space. When women's bathrooms were first labeled, it was actually one of the biggest fears by our friends, the men, that all of the women were going to get attacked in the women's bathroom because we have now put them all in a place with a door that locks and a sign that says, hello, predatory men. This is where the women live. Now the same argument is happening about where trans people are allowed to go to the bathroom. Here's a little tip. If you need to pee and you need to poop, you're gonna find a place where you can do those things safely. And if you cannot find a place where you can do those things safely, you're going to choose to not do those things, which is actually a very unsafe thing. Again, this goes back to the symbols and the language of the conversation that we're actually talking about. If we could slow down the piece where we think we know everything and actually engage in the possibility that there's something we don't know, then we can enter a conversation about diversity and social justice in a very different way because we're actually like, tell me more. Because you're actually asking a question you don't already know the answer to. This is not an area where you're supposed to just be an expert and know everything. Even working in a multicultural center, there is a lot of stuff you don't know, but you at least have some competency at a skill of being like, I don't know, tell me more about that, right? Or I don't know, I'll actually go do my own homework and find out about that instead of burdening the person who's caught up the thing that I don't even know about. So this image is a tattoo I have, I have many tattoos, and I actually got this to slow down. And I say that because how many legs does an elephant have? Feel free to put it in the chat if you feel smart. How many legs does an elephant have? Some of you are like, I didn't know we had to type. Okay, good job. Four. How many legs does this elephant have? Uh, uh, uh. You get like a spinning rainbow ball or a blue screen, be inclusive, right? So the artist intended to draw an optical illusion where the number of feet is different than the number of pelvises. But even when you know that this is an optical illusion, even if you've heard of MC Escher, he's the guy who draws all the weird things, right? Yeah, he is. Okay, so is it MC Escher who draws weird things, who draws optical illusions? There is something in our minds that's like, mm, no, the answer is this. Or mm, there's something wrong with this drawing. And now we're all the way back to ethnocentrism with the maps. Where is the state of Texas? That is about our comfort and us centering ourselves with our own knowledge so that we can have a conversation from our recliner with our favorite beverage and our favorite snack about being uncomfortable. You can't prepare to be uncomfortable. That's actually not how this works. You can get comfortable with being uncomfortable, but this particular drawing is meant to be drawn the way that it was drawn, not the way you want it to be drawn. 
And that is ultimately the biggest starting place. We like to think about this work as building blocks. And sure, your beliefs or thoughts or words or actions or habits or values ultimately become this legacy that might be your kid. It might be 40 houses out. It might be seven generations out. But if you're not consciously doing it, then you're still making that same impact. You're just making it unconsciously instead of consciously. Some of you may be more familiar with the golden rule. So if I were to ask you, what is the golden rule? You often sound like pirates, right? Like you're like, do unto others as to you wish to be undone to you or something like that. So I'm not gonna ask for pirate talk. But what I am going to introduce is something called the platinum rule. Tony Alessandro's research of the platinum rule is that you wanna go a step beyond being nice. The golden rules like be nice to each other, right? So Robert, you got on early. You do not have to volunteer. I'm just going to talk about you. But let's say that I want to take Robert to lunch. See, Robert, we're going to lunch. Good job. We're going to go eat this pizza place that I like. And I've already pre-ordered a pizza. It's extra large, extra cheese with green olives because that's my favorite. Doesn't that sound great? Okay, Robert is an easy one. So he's giving me a thumbs up. But that is the golden rule because that is my favorite pizza. I love pizza. What if Robert had pizza for dinner last night? What if Robert's gluten intolerant or just eating cold pizza or doesn't like green olives? Most people don't like green olives. Y'all do not know what you are missing. That is my favorite pizza topping. The platinum rule would be like, hey, Robert, would you like to go to lunch? One. Two, I was thinking pizza. What are you thinking? Three, uh, if we go to the pizza place, are you a sharesy kind of person or are you a personal pan pizza, personal pan pizza, eat your own, leave me alone, or you eat like this? Or are you one of the salad bar people? Do you all know the salad bar people when you go out for pizza and they, go, they only eat the salad bar? What are you doing? You have missed the entire point of going to a pizza place. I guess I first should mention to you, remember going to a pizza place. Those were lovely. Anyway, my point is, is that golden rule is pre-ordering a pizza that I like because I want to share it with Robert. That is being nice. That is also making a ton of assumptions. The platinum rule is allowing me to engage in a conversation to find out if Robert even wants to do this. And if he does, where does he want to go? And if he does want to go someplace, what kind of food does he want to eat? And does he want me to order it in advance? The platinum rule is just going one step further that maybe you don't know an answer. If you can get comfortable, with the fact that you do not know all the answers, you are actually doing diversity and social justice work. That is a free thing to practice. You do not know what color socks I'm wearing. It is deep into COVID time. Do you think I'm wearing shoes? No, I'm not wearing shoes. So you can make whatever assumptions you want to, but now you know that you don't know something. So what ends up happening is we get kind of itchy. Like, was she gonna tell us what color socks she's wearing? No, I'm not. So. If we can put this all together with our worldview, then you are actually doing the starting place work because you already have the tools to do this. What I mean by this is this is my friend Dan and his son, Dan Jr. Now I said that I'm from Texas, so this may be triggering for other people who are from Texas. But in Texas, pretty much before you talk, you have to choose Texas A&M or the University of Texas. This is, a, you have to, there's no choices. This must be made, it is important. So I went to college out of state because my mother was an Aggie and my dad was a Longhorn. We are what is called a mixed marriage. So Dan is clearly a Longhorn, clearly. I happened to be visiting when Dan Jr. was born. I happened to be in the room when Dan, my friend, held Dan Jr. for the very first time. And the very first thing that he said to his very first choice sentence ever was, I cannot wait to take you to a University of Texas Longhorn football game. That's the first thing he said to his son. So I believe this is called karma, but Dan Jr. graduated with honors from Texas A&M, not University of Texas. And somehow Dan found it in his heart to love his son anyway. Sometimes we have to come up against the expectations that other people have of us, and it is up to them to validate and accept the differences. Does that make sense? My brother was raised by atheists very proud atheist deep in Texas and is now an evangelical Christian. He had to come out as an evangelical Christian to my family that were like, I'm sorry, what? Because he didn't just come out as religious, right? He came out like, ooh, evangelical, snakes, 
that kind of Christian person. That's not everyone, but that is my brother. Right, so then when I came out as a queer person, that was not expected. That was not part of the original story either. And to my parents, at least, or my grandparents, that was not shocking to them at all. When I actually came out, my grandmother was like, Oh, no, no, no. oh wait wait you did the thing i've been practicing this for years do it again do it again do it again i missed it i missed it so she made me like uh i am a lesbian again and then she was like i love you i've been practicing this is what i wanted to say for years it was not shocking my brother coming out as an evangelical christian was shocking even to my baptist grandparents we are capable of taking in people's truth once they know what that truth is it's just whether or not we want to make room for their truth. Our assumptions is not 100% accurate 100% of the time, but our assumptions make us feel safe and prepared, which is great, except it's not about somebody else. The platinum rule is being able to extend the space for somebody else to actually be themselves. And then you figuring out how to either get comfortable with it or recognize how uncomfortable you are with it and get better. That's the difference. We start going all the way from ethnocentrism through your own identities to your own worldview that does not automatically get extended out to every single person around you that you're engaging in a conversation with. But it is an excellent starting place. So this is a mandatory list or sequence of pictures of me growing up. And the reason why is that I find that's a lot of information is kind of a fire hose. And you're getting ready to do how many sessions do we have to do with this crazy lady? This was high school graduation. Nice pearls. Reason why I like to show this is because my life taught me to be this way. Some of you are asking lots of questions and I would be too, because this is how I turned out. But your life is also the best tool you have about who and how you are and who and how you're going to be in the world. So instead of like reformatting your own hard drive, what if you just got in touch with your own hard drive and like figured it out and like, who are you? What are your subordinated experiences? Why have you felt silenced and marginalized? And who did that? This is my husband and our dogs. They were our witnesses. We got married in the Elvis Chapel. People always want to know. What is important to understand is that your dominant identities and your privileged identities are just as important. And if you can know you, you can also know how you've evolved over time. When I first started this work back in the 1900s before the internet, it was called pluralism. Then it was called multiculturalism. Then it was tolerance. Some people are like, I don't like tolerance. You know who likes tolerance? People who feel in, like that they're not tolerated. Uh, they'll take it. If you don't feel tolerated, you're like, I will gladly take toleration. That sounds great. Then you aim up from there. So then we get to awareness, celebration got a little too loud for people. So then we switched it to diversity. Then we went to social justice. Now you may hear equity and inclusion. You may even hear a diversity, equity and inclusion. Belonging sometimes gets thrown in now. But my point is, is if your life is the greatest tool, all those experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly and the awesome are the greatest tool you have to do great work and the work that we're talking about we just keep changing the words of how to do it the key is is that there is a house on fire there is a collective understanding that we can be better what does better mean that may vary but we can be better but the key is that if there is a house on fire don't mow the lawn right like mowing the lawn is not the correct thing to do Maybe you could pick up a garden hose. Some people would say garden hose is never going to put out a house fire. That's fine, but at least it's the right activity. You don't look like you're mowing the lawn while your house is on fire, right? Your house is on fire and you're like, Alanda, I was thinking about getting curtains. What do you think? Like, what are you talking about? It's very important to understand. If we collectively understand that there is a house on fire, who caused it? What's going on? We can talk about that later. It's a metaphor. If you pick up a garden hose, it might not put out the fire, but it is the right activity. And here's the kicker. If we were to pick up the garden hose, it would put out the fire. See the difference there? We are just gonna have to trust each other. And that's probably the biggest ask of the entire webinar series. If we can understand what we believe in, probably in all of my research, probably the biggest lesson I learned from researching Mother Teresa's work is whatever it is you believe in, can you question it 
so that if you survive your own raucous questioning process, you will believe in the thing you believe in even more, but you'll be able to explain it to other people. And if it doesn't survive your own raucous questioning process, well, now you know what you do believe. And when you do know what you do believe, you can take a stand. Whatever that stand is on whatever it is you believe, that's a very important thing. My brother and I engage in these conversations and I ask like, well, who are you? Like, what do you believe and how are you doing? He sends me videos or very long text messages. I know you did not type that. There's not even a typo in this text message. Very, very long things. And I'm like, that's great. What do you believe? Like, why are you sending me these video clips? Like, I want to know who you are. I want to know who you are as a person. And he can't articulate that because he's in a place where he is part of a group and this is the group that he believes. But what's interesting is us pinko commie liberals, P.S. I'm a pinko commie liberal, I did, I'm outing myself, perhaps that didn't meet your expectations or assumptions of me. But us pinko commie liberals, we're just as terrible at this. We're like, oh yeah, yeah, that thing, I don't like that thing, why? I don't remember, but I'm not supposed to like it. Oh, okay, great, what about this? Oh yeah, I totally love that thing. Okay, great, why? I don't remember, but I'm supposed to like it. Okay, great. But like, if you can't explain what you believe, you cannot take a stand for anything. Even if you deeply believe in something that I disagree with, at least we can engage in a conversation because we both know what we believe. That is a very important piece to taking a stand about your beliefs. Then you can speak or listen and listen and speak. That connection is the real work. That's the uncomfortable stuff. Not doing it does not mean you're not offending anyone. Because you can go hide in a cave and your Aunt Mildred will be mad that you didn't go to her birthday party. It's not about not offending anyone. It's taking into consideration you most certainly are offending people. Get in the game and deal with it. What are you going to do about it? You might be gifted with some feedback. But even in this webinar, I promise I have said something that somebody's been like, now why she say that thing? I promise I have offended someone. That's my job. You're listening. Ha ha. Some of you are not multitasking anymore. <laughs> but that is the conversation piece that's important. Then you can take action. Some of us just leap and we don't even, we don't even know what we're leaping for. We're just showing up. People changing their Facebook squares to different colors. They don't even know why. So then that gets misappropriated by something else and they find out like, wait, what? What does it stand for? That's been up for three hours, right? Because you're just doing stuff. Don't just do stuff. You need to own stuff. What does that mean for you? That's how you act. If you can do that, then we can all fly our own weird freak flags. I am a weirdo, totally a weirdo with very few skill sets. I can fold the fitted sheet which is impressive to some. And I can tell jokes about lots of very controversial topics. Short of that, nobody wants to shelter in place with me. Please feel free. He needs help, send beer. I am weird, but I am very relatively occasionally confident in my weirdness. I'm still working on it, but like, yeah, I'm weird. Okay, so this is who I am. I am a very strange combinations of things I vehemently agree with. I vehemently disagree with, and then there's all this stuff in the middle that is very incongruent, but I'm responsible for it all. One of my mantras is that we can do the best we can with what we got some of the time. If you can do the best you can with what you've got some of the time, that's a lot better than nothing never. That is really doing the work. If you take time to notice, notice your own patterns, notice who you are, who you aren't, who they are, who they aren't, when you're this way, when you're that way. Noticing is your own homework. That's taking responsibility for yourself and who you are and how you are and literally is the starting place. Now this is just the beginning of the webinars. There's four different sessions. This is the first one. There will be more. Feel free to send text messages to 202-670-4262. I'm happy to answer questions as we go along, but I wanna make sure that I'm one, respectful of your time, and two, that as these recordings go to everybody who's registered, I wanna make sure that you have the ability to ask questions in real time, even if you're watching the recording. So again, the number is 202-670-4262. It is exactly one hour. I am a trained professional, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for coming. Any thoughts or comments or anything I can get you before you head out? Otherwise, I'll see you October 20th. No questions?
gobsmacked by my genius, I'm sure. Well, thank you all for attending. And I truly appreciate everything that just said. And I've been writing notes, so I'll send out emails about the notes that I have sent, I have made. But please stay tuned. Uh, this is a continuing conversation and we do appreciate your time. Thank you and have a great night. Good night, y'all.